Hi, that's me. That's where I work. That's what I do, but it's not really relevant to this talk anyway, so moving on. My legal department requires that I start this with a couple of disclaimers. First, I'm not an attorney. This talk is not legal advice. This talk is for entertainment purposes only. Consult an attorney for any specific advice on anything I'm talking about here today. And second, this talk is mostly going to be US-centric. Property law, uh, intellectual property laws and customs vary around the world. And again, consult an attorney if you have specific questions. I'm gonna be covering a lot of topics, and by the nature of time, I can't dive super deep into anything I'm talking about here. Any of these topics could easily be an entire career. I'll be happy to answer questions afterwards, but hopefully this will give you at least a solid basis for learning more in the future. Disclaimers out of the way, let's start at the start. What is intellectual property? First, we need to define property. For our discussion, let's consider property to be an object over which you have some level of exclusive control. In law, this control takes the form of rights which are exclusive to you. If you own some land, that means you get to say who builds on it or who enters it. Not all rights apply in all cases, but roughly speaking, it's enough for now. So back to IP. Literally speaking, it's property that is intellectual rather than physical. If you paint a painting, you probably own the physical object of the painting. You can sell it, rent it, destroy it, whatever. But you also own this abstract concept of your creativity manifested as a painting. And just like the physical object, you own uh, and control certain rights over that abstract part. Before we jump into IP as it is today, let's quickly talk about where it came from. For the tradition that became US IP law, it pretty much all started in 1624 in England. Patents existed before then, but they were generally one-off decrees by the king or queen for control over entire industries and were deeply unpopular. The statute of monopolies transferred most of that control over to the English parliament, formalizing those monopolies and making sure they stayed temporary. This was revisited again with the Copyright Act of 1710, more commonly known as the Statute of Anne. Whereas the Statute of Monopolies was mostly concerned with people inventing new industries, this was about the rights of a creative person over their work. While frightfully vague by modern standards, it established a legal tradition of copyright that we would inherit. The US Constitution addressed intellectual property directly saying, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. This was later refined into both law and regulation and the jurisdiction of the US Patent and Trademark Office and the US Copyright Office. In some other IP traditions, mostly continental Europe, authors' rights to their creation is considered an inherent or moral right. In the US, we treat intellectual property as the domain of law. You have only the rights assigned to you by law and nothing more. Always keep in mind this is a patchwork of new laws updating the old. In many situations in intellectual property law, the true answer to a question can only be determined by a court. It's going to be based not just on laws and regulations, but on centuries of case laws and writing. I'll be careful about my word choice as much as I can, but basically everything I say here today would require a dozen except fours if I was being 100% accurate. To say it again, if you need specific advice on any of these things, speak to an attorney. But onward to the adventure and the four main branches of intellectual property. They are, briefly, copyrights protecting creative works like novels, songs, or source code, Patents, protecting inventions like the latest consumer gadget or algorithm. Trademarks, protecting brand recognition. And trade secrets, protecting the right of commercial entities to keep secrets. Copyright is the most common form of intellectual property, so let's look at that one first. Meet Bob. Bob wrote a book. Bob sells copies of that book to people that want to read it. But someone buys a copy of his book and then starts selling it to other people themselves. Obviously, if we want more people to write books, we have to prevent this. And thus was born copyright law. There are six rights that are assigned exclusively to the copyright holder. Three of them are about the rights of public performance, which doesn't generally apply to software, so these three are the ones that are most important to us. The first is the right to make more copies of a work. The second is the right to create new works based on the old work. And the third is the right to sell or give away uh, copies of the work to the public. If you own the copyright for a work, only you get to do those things. The biggest piece of copyright law in the US is the Copyright Act of 1976. It basically called a full do-over on US copyright law, defining those exclusive rights we just saw, what could be copyrighted, and what exceptions would exist. The biggest change as part of this law is that copyright was now completely automatic. You no longer have to register with the US Copyright Office at all. You have copyright protection from the moment your work is created. For something to qualify for copyright protection, it has to meet three main qualifications. First, it has to be original, simply meaning you have to have created it. Second, it has to be a work of authorship. There are eight categories that uh, are defined as works of authorship, but the two main that you'll run into in technology are literary works and graphic works. Yes, this means that as far as the law is concerned, your source code is the same as a novel. And third, it has to be fixed in a tangible medium. This means that a dance performance isn't covered by copyright, but a video recording or script of it would be. Sometimes it's easier to think about what can't be copyrighted. First off, facts are not subject to copyright protections, period. 
Ideas or concepts aren't allowed because they're not fixed in a tangible medium. Anything made by a government employee during the process of their job is not subject to copyright protections, although it may get other protections like national security. Uh, work must be creative to qualify for copyright. The usual counterexample here is a phone book that's usually deemed to be a simple arrangement of facts and thus not creative enough to be uh, subject to copyright protections. And finally, a useful article isn't covered. Usually the example here is the lines on graph paper can't be copyrighted. Uh, that last one is unfortunately under a bit of flux right now. There is a fairly recent Supreme Court decision in Star Athletic of the University Brands that declared that certain aspects of a useful article may be copyright protected if they are deemed sufficiently creative and separable from the rest of the article. And the last bit of copyright to define is how long the protections last. The Constitution specified that protections would be, quote, for limited times. Glossing over some procedural details about how you used to have to, to, have to manually, and, uh, manually register and renew your copyright, Anything that was created and published before 1923 is no longer subject to copyright at all. Anything published between 1923 and 1978 is protected for at most 95 years, depending on if they remembered to fill out all the correct forms. Works published after 1978 and owned by a human being uh, get the lifetime of the author and then 70 years after their death, while works that are published after 1978 and owned by a company are either 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation, whichever is shorter. The elephant in the room of copyright term is Mickey Mouse. Disney is certainly not the only company that lobbies for increased copyright protections, but the Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998 is unfortunately deeply associated with the company. As it stands, almost nothing has entered the public domain since 1923, and the impact on the arts is still being felt today. Coincidentally, 95 years from 1923 happens to be 2018, so we may see some changes here very soon. Either things will finally start entering the public domain again, or maybe there's going to be some new laws to extend the term of copyright again. So we know our rights, we know that we qualify for copyright, the next thing you usually see are these three words, all rights reserved. What does this mean? It's an explicit statement that you, the copyright holder, are keeping all six exclusive rights for yourself. But remember, this is also the default state. Any rights not explicitly shared by the copyright holder stay with the copyright holder. If copyright is automatic, what about things I do at work? Those are usually classified as works for hire or works made for hire. In most cases, the copyright to anything you produce in the course of your job will belong to your employer. The specifics vary state to state, and generally speaking, your employment contract will have more specific provisions that override state law, but overall, things made, by, made that are directed to be made by your employer belong to your employer. I'll cover both of these in more detail later on, but briefly, a license is a contract between the copyright owner and somebody else in order to let them use some of those exclusive rights in a limited way. Usually when we talk about licenses, we mean open source, where the other side of the contract is this generic anyone. Fair use is an exception to copyright. It allows you to use copyrighted work under certain conditions. Like that last slide, I used a copyrighted Mickey Mouse graphic in order to make a comment and critique on the Disney Corporation. That covers the overall structure and copy, uh, concept and structure of copyright. So let's look at a legal case. Oracle America v. Google. The case had three major claims of copyright infringement. Oracle claimed that Google infringed on the code of the range check function, the Java API as a whole, and a whole bunch of code and documentation files. It also had some claims around two patents, but we haven't gotten there yet. Setting aside the hilarity of the trial, and it was hilarious, let's just look at how the decisions played out. The first jury found that the range check function and the overall Java API were infringing, but the other code and documentation files were not. They were deadlocked on if the infringement on the APIs was fair use and did not reach a verdict. The judge reversed two of the decisions. First, he said that the code and documentation files were infringing, but the APIs were not. He held that the APIs did not meet the requirements for copyright protection as they are, quote, a system or method of operation, which doesn't count as a work of authorship. Oracle appealed that decision, and an appellate court overruled the original judge, saying that APIs were, quote, a concrete statement in a tangible medium, as well as being a creative work, and thus are subject to copyright protection. But because that first trial hadn't actually reached a verdict on if the infringement was fair use, a second trial was needed to answer that. And it turns out, yes, the jury came back with a verdict that yes, it was fair use. As you would expect, Oracle is appealing this decision, but it means that in case law as it stands right now, API structures are probably copyrightable, but you probably cannot enforce that copyright in any useful way. Why do I bring this up? Because it shows that copyright is really, really hard. I keep saying that answers to most of these questions can only come from a court, but this shows the degree to which courts are still struggling to understand copyright law as it applies to software and technology. But moving on, the next major type of intellectual property, patents. Whereas copyrights protect tangible works of art, patents protect inventions. I'll slightly contradict this a little bit later, but 
whereas copyright is for these specific tangible works, uh, patents cover the entire concept of a given invention regardless of how it gets implemented. But similarly to copyrights, patents provide an exclusive right to the patent holder. Specifically, it's called the right to exclude. This means that you can prevent anyone else from using your invention. Notably, this is only a negative right for others, not a positive right for you. Even with a valid granted patent, it may not be legal for you to produce your invention for a variety of other reasons. For an invention to be patentable, it has to meet three criteria. First, the invention must be useful, as in actually do something. This is generally a pretty easy bar, but rules out things like perpetual motion machines or inventions that exist but don't actually do anything. Next, it has to be novel, meaning a new invention, meaning that it did not exist previously. It has to be sufficiently distinct from all prior inventions, called prior art and patents, that your new patent application would not cover any of those existing inventions. And finally, it has to be non-obvious, meaning that at the time of the invention, it would not have been obvious to a, quote, person having ordinary skill in the art. This is often the most contentious part of patent examination, as patent examiners aren't experts in every field that people submit patents about. Uh, so they usually rely on post hoc examination by the courts to decide what was or was not obvious. But let's say you meet all of these criteria. You can get a patent, right? Not always. Certain types of inventions are deemed too categorically questionable for patent protection. There's a ton of subcategories in all four of these, but generally speaking, any invention has to be one of these four, aside from separate things for design patents and plant patents. Or to reverse it, you can't patent a pure idea with absolutely no functional invention made from it. Nor can you patent universal absolutes like laws of nature or math, although you can patent novel algorithms. So the line there, real fuzzy sometimes. Also, you cannot patent any naturally occurring substance or process, even if you've put in a lot of effort to isolate it. However, you can patent manufacturing processes, and what is in isolation versus a manufacturing process, again, real fuzzy sometimes. The fundamental theory of patents boils down to enabling disclosure. We want to encourage inventors to make more awesome things, so in return, they get a 20-year monopoly to get as much commercial benefit out of their new invention as they want. But as the quid pro quo, after those 20 years are up, they have to have documented their invention so completely that anyone else in the same field could recreate it. So inventors make their buck, and society at large gets more inventions to draw from over time. The target of enabling disclosure is this person having ordinary skill in the art, which we saw before in the non-obvious requirement. This is called a legal fiction. It's a made-up person used to make certain points or assumptions in law. Unfortunately, this also means there's no hard and fast rule as to what ordinary skill is. So courts have to just kind of make this up as they go. For the most part, patents last 20 years from the date of filing. Filing, not granting. So when you put in your application, the clock is ticking. There are certain uh, extensions if the review process takes an excessively long amount of time or if you filed the patent a really long time ago and it's still working its way through the system. But usually that only adds a year or two. This is a lot shorter than copyright, and so companies have, as you might expect, figured out ways to slightly game the system. They will sometimes figure out ways to tweak inventions slightly so that it counts as being novel and then file for a new patent, meaning that they get 40 or 60 years instead of the normal 20. Because the novelty of the patent is determined by the filing date, as I mentioned, you generally want to file as early as possible because otherwise somebody might beat you to the punch. One option is to file what's called the provisional application with USPTO. It includes as detailed a description as you can possibly manage without being an actual formal patent application. You have one year from the filing of the provisional application to file an actual application, but you retain the earlier filing date. And another tool in the patent arsenal is called a defensive publication. This is generally a document that's written in the same style or specificity as a patent, but that isn't being filed as a patent. The goal is to create prior art without having to pay the thousands of dollars that it costs to file a patent with USPTO. So if you're a small company and you've invented something new and you don't feel like paying the usually somewhere in the, the, the vicinity of 10 grand to get a patent through the system, but you don't want anyone else to patent it too because then they could come after you, you can file a defensive publication, meaning that no one else will ever be able to patent this. As of 2013, uh, due to the America Invents Act, USPTO no longer handles these for you, so you have to go through certain other organizations that will publish it in a way that is legally recognized as creating prior art. With the tech industry especially, patents have become less a way to defend inventions and more of a weapon. So many companies have these enormous patent portfolios and huge cross-licensing agreements with every other large company, which are of course voided if either party sues each other, that no one can ever actually file a lawsuit. This has led to a stable solution called mutually assured patent destruction, and it's basically like the original mutually assured destruction stalemate. It works, but it's not really anything anybody feels good about. 
And that leads directly into non-practicing entities. These are companies that hold a patent, but they don't actually use it for anything other than licensing and lawsuits. Not all NPEs are bad. In fact, a lot of these are how inventions originally get from academia out to industry, but they're so often misused that you might know them by another name. Patent trolls exist only to try and squeeze money from companies by threatening or occasionally actually filing lawsuits over what subjectively feel like overly broad or really, really obvious patents. The cost of going to trial on even a really simple slam dunk, this isn't a valid patent case can be staggering, so a lot of people will settle out of court with the patent trolls, meaning they pay them to go away. Now, what's a troll lawsuit and what's a righteous underdog standing up for their legal rights will always be subjective, but both of those definitely happen. So time for another case law example. Alice Corporation versus CLS Bank International. This case revolved around four patents held by Alice Corporation on computerized versions of payment escrow systems. Alice claimed that CLS Bank was infringing on their patents. CLS counterclaimed that their patents were invalid. I'll skip over the appeals process because it's not nearly as interesting as the last case, but short version, Alice lost a whole bunch of times and appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. In the majority opinion, the Supreme Court held that not only were all four of Alice's patents invalid, the entire area of patents were invalid. To summarize the, the, um, to summarize the decision, in short, taking a non-patentable abstract process or business process and putting it on a computer is insufficient to make the invention patentable. This has led to many thousands of rejections, that graph is shown by quarter, and hundreds of patent invalidations. Notably, that graph, that's over 100 rejections a day, specifically citing Alice. To call this a big deal is an understatement. The vast majority of software patents now have a target on their back. The world of tech patents has been divided into the pre-Alice and post-Alice eras. Some people are already calling on Congress to reform Section 101 to specifically reallow these kinds of on-a-computer patents, but only time will tell how things go. Moving on from patents to trademarks. Roughly speaking, trademarks and service marks, although I'm going to only say trademarks from now on because they're basically the same thing, protect brands. They identify the source of commercial goods so consumers can trust that the thing is what it says it is. This is a bit different from copyrights and patents because we're not really trying to encourage new works. We're trying to encourage the creation of brands and thus facilitate commerce. As a concrete example, Wikipedia. The Wikipedia brand has a lot of uh, value. People trust it to be a mostly correct encyclopedia, and the Wikimedia Foundation has spent a lot of time and therefore money in improving these uh, positive feelings towards their brand. Let's say I wanted to make a competing website and get in on some of that sweet, sweet donation cash. I can't copy their website directly because copyrights are a thing, but what if I just name it my Wikipedia and put up a donation window and hope that people think it's the real thing? The Wikimedia Foundation obviously doesn't want me doing this. I'd be trading on the good name of their brand and potentially making customers angry. So they would serve me with a very well-deserved tra uh, trademark infringement lawsuit. So what can be a valid trademark? Just about anything, it turns out. Most marks are going to be words or graphical logos, as you'd expect, but anything with a strong brand association can probably be a trademark. This includes the shape of the classic Coca-Cola bottle or the MGM Lion Roar. In order to register for trademark protection, you need to either demonstrate actual use in commerce via a specimen of your service or product, or you need to file what's called an intent to use document with the USPTO, stating that you plan to use it in the near future, and then you have to actually follow up within a certain period of time and demonstrate actual use in commerce. But like with copyright, registration isn't actually required. You can put that TM symbol on anything that you assert as a trademark with no legal or official oversight. However, by registering with the USPTO, you do get certain benefits. First off, you can use the snazzy R symbol, which everyone loves. But more importantly, you start off any trademark infringement lawsuit with a presumption of validity of your trademark. With just the TM, the first thing you have to do in any trademark infringement lawsuit is prove that your mark is valid in the first place. Unlike copyrights and patents, which have a fixed term, as long as you're using a mark in commerce, it can last forever. For a registered trademark, you do need to file renewal paperwork every 10 years to prove that you're still using it in commerce. But overall, a mark can last as long as the brand it protects. Trademark infringement is a hilariously complex issue with a lot of factors. The most eight common considerations used by the courts to decide if it's infringement are known as the Polaroid factors after a 1961 infringement case involving Polaroid. I'm not going to go over all eight factors, but roughly speaking, if a common person on the street would confuse your two brands, it's probably trademark infringement. Another thing that we see in the news more often in the past few years has been trade dress infringement. You can basically consider this to be the same thing as trademarks for all practical purposes. And one final word that you may have seen in concept with uh, trademarks is the concept of dilution, or the idea that a mark has to be actively defended via litigation in order to remain valid. 
While this is technically correct, and some very valuable marks like aspirin and escalator have been lost due to degenericization, this is way overplayed in the media. As in, I've found less than 100 cases of confirmed trademark loss due to dilution over the entire history of US trademark law. But for example, this is why Google has to continue to insist that they are not a verb, because they are at a scale where they could actually possibly lose their trademark, and they really don't want to do that. Most, most people, most trademarks, not actually that vulnerable to dilution. And very briefly, the last main branch of intellectual property, trade secrets. Very simply, trade secret law protects things that you don't want to disclose, but still have commercial value. Of course, the law can't make something a secret again, but this at least gives you a legal basis to enforce that something should stay secret and to sue somebody if they leak it. The canonical example is the recipe for Coca-Cola. Recipes can't be copyrighted, and recipes are not subject to patent protection, so it has to rely on trade secret protection in order to give the company some basis for keeping this private. So that's the four main types of IP, but why do all of this? Some of it is for purely capitalistic reasons, as outlined in the Constitution. We want to encourage the creation of more works and facilitate commerce and all those good things, but there's another line of reasoning here too, to improve the public domain. Put literally, the public domain is the collection of all works that are not under any form of copyright, trademark, or patent protection. To explain the value of the public domain, we first need to talk about the commons. This usually comes up when talking about the famous tragedy of the commons theory, where if a resource is 100% communal, it'll be overused and eventually depleted. Originally, the example was shared livestock, pastures, and overgrazing, but here the resource that we care about is the creativity of artists and inventors. If their creativity was communal, they would have no reason to go and create more works, and we want them to make more works. So in return, we give uh, exclusive rights to their creations for a limited time with the promise that after they get some benefit from it, it goes into the commons and we all benefit from it. From the writings of Homer to the paintings of Hokusai to the polio vaccine, these commons or public domain works form the cultural, scientific, and technological basis of our world. They act as inspiration to future generations and as the shoulders for all new works to stand on. Works can be given over to the public domain from the start, but it can be difficult in some places. So Creative Commons has a document called CC0, which does its best to make it clear that the author of a work is intentionally giving up all rights possible over a work while not actually enforcing that in a legal sense. <laughs> this is a little bit weird. CC0 is not technically a license. It's a license wa or rights waiver. Uh, but consider this as an alternative to licenses or patents if you're working on something that you want to belong to the common heritage of all humankind. But back to things more directly related to software, licenses. Why put a license on software in the first place? If you remember back to the copyright section, by default, all rights stay with a copyright holder. In practical terms, this means if I put some code somewhere public, like say GitHub or Stack Overflow, you can't actually use that code. Just like I can't walk into an art gallery and start making t-shirts of all of their copyrighted paintings. The original and still most common form of software licensing are commercial licenses. You give the copyright holder some money, they give you a license that allows you some limited use of certain rights, like for example, you're allowed to copy it from the install disk to your hard drive, but you don't get all rights, so you can't make derivative works probably, um, and you can't resell it to the public. This usually gets wrapped up in the end user license agreement, or EULA, along with a cornucopia of other legally dubious contract clauses. But the place most of us care about licenses, like I said before, is open source. So instead of a EULA between a specific copyright holder and a single purchaser, we want a license that applies to anyone that wants to use our software. Starting from the top, the MIT license is just about as simple as they come, so let's walk through all the various sections. We start with the declaration of who owns the copyright and what years the copyright covers. As I keep saying, copyright is automatic, so we don't need that line there in order to get copyright protection, but we put it there so that at all points everyone knows exactly who owns the copyright and when. Next, we take some of our exclusive rights and we say anyone can use them subject to certain conditions. We specifically outline the rights of duplication, derivative work, and sale to the public, which are the three important ones for software. There are three conditions that you have to meet in order to use the rights granted by the license. First is the notice condition, which requires that the code always stays accompanied by that copyright notice and this license text. Then we have the YELLY part there, which has conditions two and three, which are a warranty disclaimer and a limitation of liability. Those two things together help to insulate the copyright holder from certain provisions in most state laws where a product is assumed to be fit for purpose when you sell it. We don't necessarily want people to sue us if it is not considered fit for purpose, so we put those in as a little bit of protection. So put all this together, and it means that we can put code somewhere public and someone can use it without our permission or interacting with us in any way in exchange for some fairly minor requirements. And so we've got open source, great. 
Usually the next question after I talk about the MIT license is, well, what about BSD? The BSD family of licenses are minimalist in the same way as MIT, but they usually add one or two extra conditions depending on exactly which version you look at because there's a ton. Uh, conditions around publicity and advertising generally. Unfortunately, software patents have crashed this party. Despite the fact that I mentioned that they are hopefully going to be decreasing in the future, there's still a ton of them out there and they are still dangerous. Being minimalist, BSD and MIT only deal with copyright licensing, not patent licensing. The first kind of interaction between software patents and open source that we're usually worried about is I or my company more often want to open source some code and we are asserting that we own a patent that, is, that covers some aspect of this code. So we could just put it up on the internet and we can slap it with an MIT license, but no one can actually use that code without risking being sued for patent infringement. You can't handle this in the main license, but this, this particular case a lot of people handle using an auxiliary patent grant. For example, this is part of the text from Facebook's auxiliary patent grant. Um, don't use this as an example. It's, they're getting a lot of flack for that one at the moment. <laughs> Uh, but the other case, which is somewhat more important, um, is the nightmare scenario of somebody submits a patch, you like their patch, you merge their patch, and sometime later their legal department rolls up and says, well, actually, that contribution was covered by one of our patents. We are suing not only you, but all of your users. To the best of my knowledge, this has never happened, which is good, uh, but newer licenses attempt to prevent it from the start. The text on screen there is the patent grant from the Apache 2.0 license. So the Apache 2.0 license is a lot more recent than MIT or BSD or a lot of the older sort of original wave of open source licenses. So it has what I would consider more modern legal technology in it. So it includes stuff like that patent clause for ensuring some level of patent safety as well as trademark licensing. Its definitions are a little bit more precise as to which rights are being assigned, um, all that kind of stuff. It's not as minimalist as BSD or MIT, but it's still relatively small and it doesn't put really any requirements beyond what BSD or MIT do on the end user. As opposed to copyleft, which was originally uh, described by Richard Stallman in 1985. The idea of copyleft is it's a license which allows derivative works, but puts requirements on those derivative works that they be compatible with the license of the original in some way. So we compare this to the MIT license or BSD or Apache where we give, person, we give everyone that adheres to the license the right to create derivative works but we say nothing really about what those derivative works look like. This philosophy has led to a whole family of copyleft licenses which vary slightly on what constitutes a derived work and who needs to be permitted access to the source code. But the most famous and most common copyleft license is the GNU general public license. This requires that all derivative works be licensed under GPL or a compatible license and that anyone with access to the software must be provided with the source code if they request it. The conditions of the GPL inspire a lot of fear, so let's talk about the two main ones. The first is the viral condition. This is part of the general idea of copyleft. It means that any derivative work or combined work based on GPL code must be distributed under a license that places no more restrictions on the end user than the GPL does itself. So you could use a more permissive license than GPL, but not one that is more restrictive. Unfortunately, I said any derived or combined work, and what that exactly is is a bit complicated. The obvious case is just taking some GPL code and changing it, and then having to make the resultant output be licensed under GPL or GPL compatible license. Changing something itself, obviously derived work, end of story. The more complex case is that the creators of the GPL hold that static or dynamic linking creates a derived work by the essence of how computers function. They say that network traffic or file IO doesn't count, but that static or dynamic library linking does. There's a similar case called the LGPL, which allows linking specifically as not creating a derived work. So this means that if something is under LGPL and you're using this library but not changing it, it's real clear that that doesn't activate the virality clauses. But oddly, the most applicable case law to this uh, comes from the case Galoob Toys versus Nintendo of America, where Nintendo tried to sue the makers of the Game Genie, claiming that it infringed on their copyright because it was creating a derived work on the fly. The court held that no, it did not, and that that, that is from the original uh, decision, a derivative work must incorporate the protected work in some concrete or permanent form. This would seem to indicate that in the opinion of the courts, a static link possibly creates a derived work, but a dynamic link almost certainly does not. This is, I, again, I'm not an attorney and this is not legal advice, but this certainly lends a lot of weight to the opinion that many people have that the virality of the GPL is significantly less uh, strong than its creators try to make it out to be. But as always, a court and a judge get the final say. 
The other main bugbear in this is the code sharing provision. This says that any user of a GPL tool can request the source code and all uh, the complete source code in order to build it. So not just the code for the tool, but also the entire build environment, except for system libraries, which is not well defined. Uh, this gives them the freedom to always be able to modify and rebuild any GPL-based tool that any person is using. However, this only applies to people with access to the actual binaries. With the original GPL, if you have network access to it, you don't trigger the source code sharing provision. So for instance, MongoDB is under uh, a different license called the AGPL, which extends this so that anyone with network access or local access triggers the code sharing provision. So far, I've mostly been talking about licenses as applied to software code, but a lot of projects will hopefully include non-code portions too, like documentation or screenshots. Creative Commons includes a well-tested suite of licenses that lets you dial in very specifically which rights you want to give to the person. They also maintain that CC0 rights waiver that I mentioned, but we already covered that. Here I get to put my finger on the scale and give what is just my personal opinion on this for new projects only. I take a hard stance that there's really only two options which make sense, GPL v3 and Apache 2.0. Some people are still very attracted to the minimalism of the MIT and BSD licenses, but it's a world of software patents. They're really not safe to use anymore, sorry. And if I can go a bit further, I am firmly in the permissive license cap. Uh, I do accept that there are certain cases where copyleft can be important and required, but chances are your code is not one of those cases. Closely, rela yeah, closely related to licenses are contributor license agreements, or CLAs. These have become increasingly common in large open source projects. A CLA is a contract between the contributor and either the project or the company that's acting as steward of the project. This usually looks very similar to the main EULA that's used for end users. However, there's a couple of extra provisions where you assert that you have the legal right to give whatever contributions you are sending in, meaning that either you own the copyright or you have permission from whoever owns the copyright, as well as permission to implicitly provide a patent grant for any of that code that is covered by patent. In some projects, the CLA has been replaced by the Developer Certificate of Origin, or DCO, process, which uses a much smaller legal attestation, but rather than being a single contract that you agree to once, you have to agree to this in every single commit you make, usually with a note in the commit message. But overall, it's the same general idea. You are saying, yes, I have the legal right to give this contribution, and the project is allowed to assume patent safety. To the best of my knowledge, there has never been a legal case involving CLOs or the DCO. So the best guidance I can give here is that some very good lawyers for very important projects have decided that their project requires one or the other of these in order to be safe. Talk to your legal department or find an attorney if you have questions about your specific project. And we've got a little bit of extra time, so let's talk about a few bonus topics. Fair use is this principle where you're allowed to infringe on the intellectual property of others subject to certain conditions. Mostly it's used in the context of copyright and using copyrighted material without the permission of the copyright holder. The most common confusion about fair use is that all non-commercial use is automatically okay. Commercialization is definitely a factor in if something is fair use or not, but non-commercial use is not automatically fair use. Cut it out, YouTube. The most common kind of fair use uh, is using a copyrighted image or trademarked name in order to refer to the owner of that word or mark. So for example, I can tell you that I wrote this using Apple Keynote, despite both of those being trademarked terms. Similarly, a news show could use a copyrighted logo if they're running a news story about that company. As with most things in IP, I keep saying that you can only get answers from the courts. That's doubly true for fair use. But there are four factors that are generally used by the courts in order to weigh if something is fair use or not. The first is the purpose and character of the new work, usually viewed through the lens of how transformative it is. So for example, a parody song might use the melody from a copyrighted work, but it significantly transforms everything else. The more verbatim copying you do, the less likely something is to be fair use. Next is the nature of the original work. Copying verbatim from something that is entirely or mostly factual, like a biography or an encyclopedia, is more likely to be fair use. Third is the amount of copyrighted work you used. More copying is less likely to be fair use, but very little, copyright, uh, very little copying or very much copying is not automatically one way or the other. And the last is the effect on the original work and its owner. Even a very small, highly transformative copy can still be not fair use if you are attempting to diminish the market for the original. So going back to that parody song example, the existence of a parody song, no matter how much of the original it used, generally can't be shown to diminish the market for the original song. In most cases, it would actually increase the market, like say Weird Al covering someone. But if you're unclear on fair use, just assume probably not, and then talk to the people that created the work and see if they are willing to license it to you, preferably under Creative Commons, but maybe they'll sell you a commercial license. 
And then very briefly, because we're, eh, we're not running that low on time, uh, let's talk about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. The whole law is way too complex to go over, but let's talk about two sections you should probably know about. The first is the safe harbor provision. This exempts ISPs, caches, search engines, and somewhat importantly, websites that host user-created content from copyright lawsuits under certain conditions. This is, for example, why YouTube can't be sued even though users keep uploading copyrighted videos over and over. In order to qualify for the safe harbor protections, you must first make sure that you have no knowledge of copyright infringement ahead of time. This means that you're making sure it's mentioned in your terms of service, that you're attempting to educate users to not infringe on copyright, all that kind of stuff. It can be shown that you were aware this was happening and you did nothing, you don't qualify. Second, you need to register a copyright agent. This is done through an online portal that's run by the US Copyright Office. Generally, your registered agent, yeah, registered agent is gonna be your company lawyer, but anyone can be used as a registered agent as long as they have willingly accepted the responsibility of taking your copyright notices. And finally, you need a process for copyright holders to notify you of infringement, generally called a DMCA takedown or DMCA takedown order, uh, and then you have to actually act on those when they are, get, uh, when they are received. You have to collect a whole bunch of info, uh, who, where the infringement happened, what was being infringed, the author of the infringing work, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you have to author, uh, offer the target of the takedown an opportunity to counterclaim, saying, I don't think this is infringing, please put it back up, um, at which point it becomes a copyright lawsuit and your responsibilities are nullified. Ensuring compliance with the safe harbor provisions is really important for basically all modern websites because almost everyone has something that is user specified, even if it's just avatars. So really you should talk to a lawyer about this. <laughs> the second bit that I mentioned because it's important is that the, the DMCA created uh, criminal penalties for either breaking uh, copyright, uh, copyright protection systems, more commonly known as DRM, or helping anyone else to do that. So there's been a lot of attempts to use these terms to uh, prosecute DRM removal tools like DECSS or the PS3 key or a whole bunch of these. But the Library of Congress has made it clear that certain types of DRM breaks like iOS jailbreaks for personal use are covered under fair use. The EFF and the ACLU continue to challenge the DRM sections of the DMCA. I certainly hope that they will uh, at some point succeed and invalidate these. So make sure that you donate probably more to the EFF please. Uh, and still a little bit more time, so final bonus topic is the first sale doctrine. Um, I mentioned back at the start that uh, only the holder of a copyright has the right to sell or give away that work to the public. The major exception to this is called the first sale doctrine. If you buy a book, you can't print more copies and sell them to the public, but you can sell that specific book to someone else. Generally, the Copyright Office and the courts have held that you retain the rights to the abstract work, but that when you sell a physical object, you lose most of the rights over that physical object. Unfortunately, these rights have been uh, significantly eroded in recent years. The general opinions of the courts has been that most modern media, say ebooks or uh, online song sales, what you're actually buying is a license, not an object, and therefore it is not subject to the first sale doctrine. CDs count because they're a physical object, and MP3 might count, but probably doesn't. This came to a head in the case of Werner v. Autodesk. A man uh, bought a copy of Autodesk at a yard sale and attempted to resell it on eBay, and when he did, Autodesk sued him, and the court agreed that he did not, in fact, have the legal right to sell an object that he purchased because the original buyer of Autodesk actually just bought a license. The, the physical CD was mostly incidental, and therefore there was no first sale doctrine. Be very careful uh, whenever you are buying things online and again, continue to donate to the EFF so they can keep fighting for consumer rights. So let's summarize real quick. We talked about copyrights and how they protect new and creative works. We talked about patents and how they protect and encourage novel inventions. We talked about trademarks and how they facilitate commerce. We talked about trade secrets and how they protect the right of commercial entities to keep secrets. Um, we talked about the public domain and the value of the commons, and we talked about licenses and how they give people limited use rights in order to facilitate the use of software. And finally, a few resources for your own IP journey. The Cornell Legal Information Institute has a great web-based copy of as much of US law and regulation as they can manage. Uh, if you wanna look up any of those USC, which is short for US code references in this talk, go there. Um, the book IP and Open Source by Van Lindbergh is a fantastic zero to 60 guide on basically everything I've mentioned here today and a ton more. Um, it goes into a lot more detail about how it pertains to software in particular. The USPTO website has a ton of great educational references and is home to the TESS trademark search system, which is the public access 
checking if other people have already registered your trademark system. Um, USPTO also has a patent search system, as does WIPO, but Google has created what's called Google Patents, uh, which offers a slightly better UI for navigating and indexing them. And finally, the This Week in Law podcast from the Twit Network is a great way to keep up to date with happenings in the intellectual property world. Thank you very much. Um, this talk will be very briefly uh, after this talk will be available on coder.net slash talks, as well as all of my other talks. Any questions? So the question was, if you have a, a, an existing repository that has a license and you want to change that license, what do you need to know? Uh, the short answer is you need permission from everyone that holds copyright on any of the code in that repository, anything that would be covered by the new license. Um, if you want to just leave the existing license and license all new work under the new license, you only need permission from the new copyright holders. But changing the license on an existing work requires permission from the copyright holder of that work. Um, that means that unless you have uh, requested copyright assignment from your contributors, you need permission from anyone that has ever given you code. I'll repeat it. So the question was, I mentioned trademarks exist to facilitate commerce, but what about cases where you're not actually paying for anything, like I don't pay Wikipedia any money? Uh, turns out commerce doesn't actually require money to have changed hands. Um, so Wikipedia does count as a use in commerce, um, as does open source software. Uh, any, anything that, so this gets a little bit funky. Um, I lied a little bit. Um, technically, the US Constitution only allows Congress to facilitate interstate commerce. Um, so anything that is being used more or less by someone in another state from you counts as interstate commerce and you can register with USPTO. If somehow you make an open source project that is only being used by people in your state, things get a little funkier and you have to talk to your state trademark office as well. Uh, yes. But the other one doesn't. And you want to say use uh, MIT and MU or something like that, both together. Is that usually a good idea or is it a bad idea? Uh, so the question is, what if you want to have uh, the rights sort of as the fusion of multiple licenses? Um, so you have two options. You can just sort of glue licenses together. I don't really recommend that because they're probably not going to make any legal sense when you do that. You can also dual license code um, or triple or whatever. You can have as many licenses as you want where they're all independent. Um, like you could say it is under both Apache and GPL. If you meet the requirements of the GPL, you can use the right specified there. If you meet the requirements of Apache, you can use the right specified there. Um, because you're allowed to issue as many licenses as you want, like Microsoft Word has been licensed to probably millions of people independently. Uh, whichever requirements they meet, they can use that license and be happy. Um, specifically with the GPL, it gets a little funky because of how the virality clauses activate that it may not, there are certain licenses that are not legal to combine with the GPL, as in it would invalidate the GPL itself. But uh, overall, sure, you can have as many licenses as you want and they, it's, it's like a big old if block. Yes. My question is about creating a personal application and how you protect yourself from the company wanting to capitalize on that. Yes. Um, so the question was uh, creating a personal application and how to protect yourself from a company. Do you mean specifically your employer or any company in general? Um, OK, so your employer, hopefully, probably everyone here lives in California. Um, California is, I think, probably the best state in the nation for this. Um, the California state constitution and state law provisions are real specific that if you make something in your spare time without using any company resources and the slightly fuzzy one without using any proprietary knowledge gained through your employer, and if the new product or work is not in direct competition with your employer, you own it. Um, your employer might ask you to assign copyright or patent to them, but 
if you are willing to assert that you did not use any company resources, pretty much, um, they're not allowed to own it, regardless of what's your employment contract. Other states, not nearly as good. For example, New York is probably the worst state, and literally everything you do in your spare time, no matter what, if you think of it in the shower, it belongs to your employer, period. Um, probably talk to an employment attorney. Again, not legal advice. Um, when, you, when we're talking about companies in general, um, that's where defensive publications can come in. Um, a lot of people have been pushing open source projects to use them a lot more liberally. Um, that if you publish that I have created this thing, um, you can ensure that no one else can come along later and say that they invented it and patent it. Um, defensivepublication.org has some great guides on how open source projects can engage in defensive publication in the wake of USPTO no longer handling them. Hey, thanks. This is a great talk. Uh, question: uh, Could you uh, expand on the uh, GNU uh, example, like the virality thing? Like, practically, what does that mean? Uh, so the question was uh, in, uh, expanding on the the virality section of the GPL, uh, and that's where it gets real weird because if I'm going with the way that the the FSF, the creators of the GPL, say that it works, it's basically if you use a GPL library with any other library even if you don't modify it, just like the fact that you are require, you, you know, if you, if you require this as part of your software, you've created derived work of the synthesis of these and the resulting work must be licensed under GPL or compatible. As I said, I do not personally believe and many other people do not believe that that is actually true and that that is probably not enforceable um, because it has been shown that derived works require that some aspect of the original is actually literally copied. Certainly, if you literally copy a GPL library into your Python code base, yes, you have, a, you have activated virality, sorry. But uh, overall, I think it's overblown. But again, as I keep saying, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not actually allowed to say that with any legal weight behind it, although neither are most lawyers. Um, really, the answer will only come when someone sues you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> There's no case law on it, unfortunately. All of the cases around the GPL have been much more cut and dry, like you took GPL'd code and modified that code and then didn't share it, which that's super obviously not okay, but the linking thing hasn't been tested yet. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, I was messing with a project in my spare time and I developed a clone of a popular board game. What kind of things should I have taken into consideration given that you know, Hasbro is the owner of this board game uh, sort of. Okay, uh, so board games are real fun. I actually worked in the games industry for a while, um, and they have some real interesting rules about intellectual property. Systems of rules are not subject to copyright protection. So for instance, the rules to Monopoly, like the literal text of them is copyrightable, but the idea of the rules is not, because that's the, the idea of the rules is not fixed to tangible medium. So you can't copy the literal rules, but if you're re-implementing Tetris, but not calling it Tetris because names can be copyrighted, um, images can be copyrighted, the game pieces could be copyrighted, um, the board would be copyrighted. But if you're not copying anything literally, you're just copying the idea of a clone, that's totally okay. Uh, they have no basis to sue you, except that certain game companies, and I believe Monopoly is still one of them, uh, are patented which I'm not totally clear on why that was allowed because it really seems like it shouldn't have been, but there are a few board games that are under patent protection for some reason. <laughs> the vast majority of board games and video games uh, are not obviously covered by patent because it's real weird. Um, so cloning games, they don't get to have intellectual property protection because they're systems of operation. Well, at this, at this point, um, it's time to wind up and uh, thank Noah sure. very much for the presentation. I'll be, I'll be here, you can come ask me questions.